I, I was standing for what I believed in that ultimately what's really going to change things is the love of Jesus Christ being showed. And the love of Jesus Christ is particular. It's not the love of the world. It's an unconditional love, a love that loves past sin, a love that loves past divides. And that's what's needed on both sides. Go back to July 21st, 2020. Where were you? And why was a choice to physically stand a choice that required so much boldness? Right. That, that, that really is the question. Why was it a, a choice in the first place? So you have to go back just a little bit before July 21st to the tragic death of George Floyd. Um, so as, as that happened um, and the world is in complete disarray, there is the rising of the Black Lives Matter movement and organization. Um, and me, an NBA player, is watching you know, this video on the Internet. And I'm saying to myself, what is the right way for me to respond in this moment in a way that could truly help or, or bring some type of healing? And so I was going to service one night and our pastor was preaching on the, the, the moment when Jesus is being captured by the Roman guard and how Peter lunges forward. And this is during the time of the riots. Peter lunges forward and he cuts off the guy's ear and Jesus stops him. And he says, those that live by the sword will die by, will die by the sword. And Jesus heals the guy's ear, he reaches out his hand and heals the guy's ear. And I said to myself, I want to be an agent of healing and, and, and bringing people together in this time that I know is going to be divisive, that I know that's going to be white versus black. But I didn't know how that was going to come out in any way. Yeah, and yeah. so the, the league had been shut down by COVID, um, but then they decided to bring it back in what was called the NBA bubble. And in the NBA bubble, there were a lot of talks about all of the players, the staff, the refs, everyone kneeling for the national anthem in solidarity for black lives. And uh, so we were in the bubble and a team had just knelt the day before us. And so our team officials all called us into a meeting um, and they said, listen, this is you guys' choice. You guys decide what you want to do. We're going to stay out of it. And uh, so now it's just me and my teammates and everyone is saying we don't have a choice but to kneel. There is no choice in this. We're going to kneel. Everyone's going to kneel. The other team already knelt. We can't be the only team that doesn't kneel. It just is what has to happen. Um, and that it, it, it made me feel uncomfortable because I, I didn't see kneeling as the only way to support black lives. My life being supported by the gospel and ultimately knowing that for me, it's not going to be a movement, an organization, a political party that can really change the hearts of men because racism and all of the things that plague our society are heart issues. And we need the gospel. We need the love of Jesus Christ that can love past sin, past divides, white versus black on both sides. And so a teammate turns towards me and says, Jonathan, what are you going to do? And I said, fellas, I'm not going to kneel and I'm not going to wear that Black Lives Matter T-shirt. And chaos erupts. Everyone's like, oh, my gosh, this is going to be terrible. Um, and everyone really just gets up and leaves. And so um, that night was a night that I was on the phone with my pastor telling him, like, I, I don't know if you understand how crazy this moment is going to be. I'm going to be called names. People are going to come after me because of what I'm about to do. And that's when he said, you can't stand for God and God not stand for you. So on July 21st, like you said, I found myself in the NBA bubble about to run out onto the court to warm up and ultimately stand um, while every one of my teammates and everyone else in the entire you know, room you know, decided to kneel. And Jonathan, what were you hoping to communicate by standing? What, what I was hoping to communicate was simply my version of what could really change things. And so everyone else, my teammates included, were kneeling for what they believed in. But I, I was standing for what I believed in that ultimately what's really going to change things is the love of Jesus Christ being showed. And the love of Jesus Christ is particular. It's not the love of the world. It's an unconditional love, a love that loves past sin, a love that loves past divides. And that's what's needed on both sides. Because both sides are up in arms about what's been done or what's being done. Um, but if we could choose to love each other the way that God loves us, which is in spite of our sin, in spite of our shortcomings, the Bible says herein is love. Not that we first loved God, but that God first loved us and Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And so that's the message that I wanted to mm. pan across. I wanted everyone to say to humble themselves. And in this time of being angry and upset to say, hey, if I'm throwing stones right now, I'm throwing stones from a glass house. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all done things that are wrong. And if I could humble myself and say and, you know, and forgive or repent in some type of way, then we could truly have healing. That is so good. And that is humbling to hear and refreshing to hear from you. And um, you obviously knew that failing to conform to what was going on in the culture and even right there in your team was going to result in a lot of backlash. Uh, 
what made you willing to go through that and stand up to that storm? Well, I, I would say what made me willing was that I, I knew that I wasn't standing for just myself. I wasn't standing on my word. I, I, I knew that I was standing on the word of God and all that I had been taught and learned through a relationship with God over you know the, the four years that I was at Jump Ministries Global Church under Dr. Hepburn. And so he taught us all about love and, and developing a relationship with God and that God won't let you fail and that faith demands a response from God, all those different things. And so the same way that he was teaching on the way that Jesus healed the man's ear that was ultimately going to be a part of crucifying him, that's what the, the manner and the heart posture that I wanted to take on. Mm. And so what, what made me willing was that, um, you know, having the right people around me that I, I knew I wasn't standing alone. It wasn't just me up there. It was my church family. It was my wife. It was my family as mm. well. And, and all of those people who felt the way that I felt, but didn't have the courage to stand in that moment. But, but surely you knew that this was a risky move, right? I mean, you were, you were a part of a team. I mean, we're, we were, were you nervous? Were you concerned about what this would do in terms of the unity on the team? Yeah, I, I was terribly afraid to be quite honest with you. I, I didn't sleep the night before. Um, you know, I, I knew my teammates and, you know, other people would be upset with me for sure. Um, and and the, the entire time that I was standing, I was praying under my breath, you know, God, purify my motives. Let this be about you and not me because I, I, I knew it was coming. And perhaps this might even affect the performance of your team. This could even break up the unity and your, and your ability to win as a team. Jonathan, what, if anything, do you think that the media and popular culture got wrong about your intentions when you stood? I would say that you have both sides of this. The, the, the first side automatically thought that I was, you know, using, you know, my Christianity or religion as a scapegoat to forego the support of black lives or that um, I didn't, you know, one of the things that I said to my teammates after we had a, a, an only teammate teammate meeting after I stood and, you know, guys were upset with me. I said to them, I see the same things that you guys see. I just have a different answer than you have. And so it's not that I didn't see George Floyd's death and doesn't think that it's, you know, incredibly tragic or I don't see that there's racism in the world. I just know from experience um, that it's a heart issue and that God is truly going to be the thing that can heal it. And so, you know, th there were those people who made it about not supporting black lives or those people who made it, you know, per, uh, all about the flag and all about, um, you know, not wanting to kneel for nationalism. And I absolutely love the country that I'm afforded to live in. Um, and one of the things that my pastor says all the time about us is that we haven't done everything right, but we haven't done everything wrong either. And that's the, you know, the, the posture that I view America in as, you know, America hasn't done everything right, but, you know, they haven't done everything wrong either. And so I love the country that I live in, but it wasn't purely about standing for the flag. It was really about me saying, I know that Jesus Christ is the answer for the problems that we see in the world. How do I know that? Because he's been the answer for me. And the same love that I'm talking about is going to heal the world is the same love that found me when I wasn't even checking for God. Like I told you, I was so used to working for love, but it's the unconditional love of Christ that found me um, and has me you know, healed to a, to a certain degree that I am you know, today. Everything you're saying is resonating with me. I'm saying yes, yes to your reasoning, yes to that wisdom, yes to your, your biblical worldview and your understanding that this is a problem of the human heart. But some people still just have a, a real problem understanding your choice, particularly as a black man. Um, wh why is it so much harder because of you being black for them to understand why you did what you did? Well, obviously, there's there's the there's the point of you know at the end of the day tribalism that obviously you know what happened to George Floyd was tragic and that's a black man and and there should be a level of black solidarity and so many people whether they agree with the tone or the messaging of the Black Lives Matter movement or organization just went along with it because they were black and and I can understand why but I, the reason for me was that I had a, a greater allegiance that surpassed my skin color and that was ultimately my allegiance to Christ. And so, so many people mm. that look like me, that agree with me, you know, saw themselves as Christ first and, you know, black second. Um, and so that, that's why, you know, they agree with me or disagree with me. Jonathan, you had anticipated the night before with great anxiety that there would be some backlash. That wasn't surprising to you. Uh, but once it was all said and done, was there anything that was surprising to you about this whole experience? I may not say surprising, but... You know, everyone talks about the backlash. Everyone talks about all of the, the negativity that came out of, 
um, you know, me deciding to stand. But there also was so much encouragement that completely engulfed, you know, the, the majority of the negativity, people who who agreed with what I decided to say and decided to do um, and were encouraged and inspired by the stand. And they said to themselves, you know what, I want to stand as well. And I want to stand in this way, in the manner in which this young man stood. Unfortunately, we know that there are those who profit off of creating division. And uh, this this isn't just what it appears to be on the surface. There's often uh, undercurrents of intention that get more get more ratings when people are angry with one another than when they are working together in solidarity. And unfortunately, that's the kind of culture that we live in. You say things like courage is not the absence of fear. It's the conquering of fear. Why is that important to note in today's culture? Standing up for what you believe in, especially if you're standing up you know, for the word of God in Christ, is only going to become harder and harder to do, but only the more necessary. And so no matter what, all of the decisions that I've made in the past four to five years, if it's preaching at church, if it's standing in the bubble, I was met with intense fear about what people would think about me, how I would do, how I would mm. bear, if I would, if I would say the right words or if I would come across the right way. Um, and they were all reasons for me to turn back and say, no, I'm not going to do it. Um, but because I decided to do it, I can see all of the fruits of what God is using it to do. I'm, I'm on this show with you because I decided to stand. And so, um, it just it just really resonates with me that courage is not the absence of fear. And, and so many of us think that the Bible says to be ye courageous and be bold. And we think that the only way that we can do that is to if, if we have any sense of fear, then we're not doing it right or we don't have any faith. Um, but when we do feel that fear, we turn to the one who truly does um, is able to strengthen us and keep us in that time. And so that's exactly what I did. I felt the fear. I felt the anxiety. But I said, God, I know that you're with me because of the moments that I had before. And I know that you're going to see me through this moment. Hi, I'm Kirk Cameron. Thanks for watching this clip from my interview with Jonathan Isaac. Please like and comment on this video. And if you're not subscribed, please hit the subscribe button and ring the bell so you never miss another episode.